Hello, you're listening to Thinking Social and Solidarity Economy, an online series of presentations and discussions that brings you the people and the ideas that are defining how we understand more just and humane alternatives to social and economic life. Recorded at a live in-person event in 2023, in this episode, we bring you the very first Jack Quarter Lecture on Social Economy, organized by the Center for Learning Social Economy and Work at the University of Toronto. It features Rutgers University professor Priscilla Ferreira in a talk entitled Popular Education and the Economics of Abolition. So welcome to the inaugural Jack Quarter Lectureship on the Social Economy. Before we begin, I wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. My name is Marcelo Vieta, and I'm Associate Professor in Adult Education and Community Development and Director of the Center for Learning, Social Economy and Work here at Boise, University of Toronto. On behalf of the Center for Learning, Social Economy and Work, Rousseau, Kutai, and two other association that had their conferences earlier on this week at Congress, the Canadian Association for the Studies and Cooperation and the Association for Nonprofit and Social Economy Research, I am honored to initiate today the inaugural Jack Quarter Lectureship on the Social Economy. And I also want to warmly welcome and thank the first Jack Quarter Social Economy Lecturer, Professor Priscilla Ferreira, who so readily and kindly agreed to come and speak to us during her research needed result. So first, before Priscilla comes up, Allow me to say a few words about the lectureship. The Jack Quarter Lectureship on the Social Economy is in memory and honor of Professor Jack Quarter, who passed away in early 2019 as full professor in the Adult Education and Community Development Program here at OISI. For over 50 years, all of them, by the way, at OISI, Jack was a friend and colleague to many in the fields of adult education, community development, and the social economy. And it's so great to see many of you, uh, many of Jack's friends uh, and colleagues here today. A renowned researcher, prolific writer, and much loved teacher, Jack mentored hundreds, if not thousands of Canadians and others from around the world studying or involved in the social and solidarity economy. Jack helped co-found several groups that many of you here today belong to, such as the Canadian Worker Cooperative Federation, the Canadian Association for the Studies for Studies and Cooperation, Association for Nonprofit and Social Economy Research, and its journal, the Canadian Journal of Nonprofit and Social Economy Research. Jack was also one of the research leads of the Crop Canada Multi-Year and Multi-Plate Social Economy Hub Initiative, which helped conceptualize and map the social economy in Canada. He wrote or co-wrote dozens of books, you can see here. Uh, and articles on the social economy, workplace and economic democracy, and labor issues, including co-authoring the much-used Understanding the Social Economy, a Canadian Perspective, and Understanding the Social Economy of the United States. Before his passing, Jack was also the finalist for the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada's Impact Award, recognizing the highest achievements in social sciences and humanities research, knowledge mobilization, and scholarship uh, supported by SHRG. The Jack Porter Lectureship is cared for and organized by the Center for Learning Social Economy and Work, which Jack, by the way, helped co-found with us, and is generally made possible by a donation from another renowned scholar of Canada's cooperatives and the social economy, University of Calgary Mirrors Professor George Melnick. The pandemic kept us from hosting the Jack Porter Lectureship earlier. We thank Professor Melnick for his kind donation and patience. Professor Melnick only had one stipulation for how to use the funds for the lectureship. Post it at Boise. Post it at Boise to keep Jack's memory present. We are thankful to Kasai, its board, and the conference organizers for their enthusiastic support in holding the first Jack Porter lectureship during this conference. And I also want to extend uh, many thanks to Clouseau graduate assistant Delania Freddy for helping us organize tonight. 
So we will be holding a reception right after today's lectureship in the Nexus Lounge on the 12th floor. So don't go away. There's lots of food there and we'll celebrate and, uh, and be together. So without further ado, it is also my pleasure to ask Emma Pinkowski to come and introduce Professor Ferreira. Tema is an AECD PhD student, Solidarity Economy practitioner, and the first, uh, first and the, I can't read my right, <laughs> and theorist and community uh, activist. Um, one of our brilliant PhDs, Tema is also the recipient of the 2022 Jack Porter Prize on the Social Economy. Tema? Hi, everyone. I am very happy to be introducing the inaugural Jack Porter Lecture on the Social Economy here today at the Kasai Conference, Professor Priscilla Ferreira. Dr. Ferreira's talk is entitled Popular Education and the Economics of Abolition. Dr. Ferreira is an Afro-Brazilian feminist, abolitionist, and social justice educator. She is also assistant professor of geography and Latinx and Caribbean studies at Rutgers University. Dr. Ferrer's work and activism focus on Black and solidarity economies, Black geography, and community-engaged pedagogies and scholarship. Dr. Ferrer has been organizing with communities of color inside and outside of academia over the past 20 years and collaborated in several popular education projects internationally. They are the coordinator of the English and Social Justice School, a language justice a language justice black co-op that offers language training, interpretation, and translation services for social movements and creates opportunities for international education and political collaboration for and with black grassroots activists, scholars, and artists. Dr. Ferreira is also a board member of Collective Diaspora, a new membership-based organization of black cooperatives and black-led co-op support organizations from across the African diaspora. Dr. Ferrer's recent publications include a critique of white centrism and epistemic injustice in solidarity economy movements in the Journal of Geoforum, experiential narratives of black feminist research methodologies in Women's Studies Quarterly, and a co-authored book in Portuguese, Tia Lucina of Favela City of Goddesses, the Political Biography of a Community Organizer, forthcoming in 2020. I'd now like to ask the 2023 inaugural Jack Corder Lecturer on the Social Economy, Dr. Priscilla Ferrer, to the book. Thank you. Good, good evening, everybody. Boa noite. Todos os brasileiros da casa. Wow, it's, uh, it's such a pleasure um, to be here tonight. And I feel very honored to have been invited um, to do the inaugural uh, Jack Quarter Lecture on Social Economy at OIS. And I want to thank the uh, co-organizers, uh, Daria Tarhan, Jennifer Sumner, Dr. Uh, Katie In Integer, and Lance McGrady, and also Marcelo Vieta, for the invitation. Um, and also I'd like to thank Delania Segretti for um, supporting us this day, organizing my trip here from Rio de Janeiro. Thank you everyone for being here tonight. I honor and I thank the native peoples of this land and I ask permission to stand here as a humble guest tonight. I also wanna, I also wanna honor and thank my ancestors and I have in my heart right now um, the memory and the presence of my grandmother, um, Damiana Pinto, who um, was a landless campesino organizing with the Theology of Liberation movement and whose life was touched by the Freudian um, adult education movement. And she started the first grade when she was 54 um, and made it through the uh, started first grade at the age of 54 and made it through fourth grade which was the minimum educational degree um, um, requirement to run for offices. So she was one of the first um, city council officers working of the emerging working party in the 80s, in the first election in the law in Brazil. So this um, I offered to my grandmother and also, um, of course, to Professor Jack Quarter, who trusted and walked alongside the people. I'm gonna read for 10 minutes 
just to get some of the ideas uh, conveyed. And then I'm going to talk about three uh, popular education initiatives um, that I have been a part of. And I chose these three because they were, they happen at different stages of my educational career. So the first one as an undergrad, the second one as a grad student, and now more recently as a professor. I feel it's I feel, I think, and I organize at the intersection of multiple identities. I am a queer Afro-Latina, Afro-Brazilian immigrant living in the United States. I come from a working class interracial family who taught me from a very young age the foundations of community economies, self-defense, and autonomy. These principles have held and guided me from my childhood through my adult life, while I've had to struggle, sometimes literally fist fight, as I learned to navigate elitist majority white educational spaces throughout my entire life. My black elders and community mentors and political comrades, especially the women, have taught me how to acknowledge and honor black brilliance while developing tools to speak uncomfortable truths with respect and compassion when I need to speak up against injustice that challenge my people's very existence. Today, I hold a so-called privileged position as a tenure track pro assistant professor at a public research university uh, in the United States, an institution of hostility is felt and clear. The fact of underrepresentation and over policing of the social identities I embody within what I call the intellectual industrial complex require more than being an assistant professor. In fact, to survive and thrive within academia, I must be more than an assistant professor. I must be an insistent professor. And I insist that learning is collective. It is relational, it should be valued and supported regardless of how much resources, how many degrees, grants, endowment, visibility, that the neoliberal paradigm of formal education is willing to acknowledge or hold faithful. Heart means this kind of commitment with community engaged education and research takes boldness, trust, patience and risks. And it also takes resources. So two key questions for those of us interested in um, truly committed community engaged work and scholarship are, where are the resources and how can I redistribute them? The university is part of a global value chain of knowledge production under the dictates of a racial capitalist regime the intellectual industrial complex most often functions to capture knowledge and turn knowledge producers into intellectual captives within boundaries of discipline and institutional traps. Epistemic surveillance disproportionately constrains the students and faculty of color who are asked to meet the same meritocratic standards as members of privileged community within academia while we must also reach such levels of excellence while dodging bullets to protect our creative, our, our leisure and our organizing time and safeguard our emotional and our intellectual resources. Abolitionist organizers and, and scholars such as Mayer and Maria Makaba have examined the nexus between education and the prison industrial complex particularly the relationship between schools and jails, what is known as the school to prison pipeline. They have demonstrated the linkages, that the linkages were not just physical in terms of how school buildings resembles prisons, but also how pedagogies, pedagogies can replicate and reinforce the idea of youth of color as potential public enemies inherently violent 
and prone to crime, potential super predator to be kept under surveillance with metal detectors, full uniforms, and armed security guards. The nexus between higher education and the military prison industrial complex, however, has not been as much explored as the school to prison pipeline. Scholars like the Varian discuss the relationship between university, urban redevelopment planning, policing, the displacement of communities of color, and he critiques the real state grab and the speculative style branding of the modern universe, universities, like must be say Toronto, like others. The Varian contend that Quote, we must no longer evaluate colleges and universities simply by their stated aim of knowledge production and dissemination. They have, quote, become rapacious pro-growth behemoths that, dis that discuss the students as consumers, alumni as shareholders, and the world beyond campus walls as either real prime state or dangerous threat to their brand. And he also asked a crucial question, has the very notion of the public good been perverted um, when it is used to justify multi-million dollar tax exempt endowments, an enormous contingent of low wage work or labor force and the elimination of affordable housing in neighborhoods around campuses, as well as increased racial profiling, end quote. Besides its microeconomic roles, in urban economies of redevelopment and surveillance, within the very walls of the university, its community also endures the policing of the full expression of human creativity and human experience in ways that constrain and punish in explicit and implicit ways, non-traditional, non-white, non-anglocentric, undocumented, black, indigenous, intuitive, and neurodivergent forms of knowledge. Epistemic surveillance and epistemicide, the killing of knowledge, as a power mechanism to concentrate visibility, power, and resources in the heteropatriarchal, white centric, and global north zones of the global intellectual value chain creates what Barry calls um, organizational containment. Organizational containment is especially experienced by those of us who intend to collectivize university resources, visibility, and reward. Eatman and all have adverted that, quote, institutions of higher education have typically lagged behind in supporting and rewarding collectivize, collectivizing approaches. Academic discipline continue to uphold disconnected or so-called peer forms of research and are suspect of community engaged scholarship. Tenure and promotion guidelines reward individual, uh, reward traditional research while counting public engaged research as merely community or public service and not scholarship, end quote. For instance, single authorship is valued over co-authorship in tenure and promotion assessment in ways that reinforce a discouraging message that collective and shared knowledge is not assessed in equal footing with individual and I would say privatized knowledge. Um, in instances when, even in instances when the result of such single author publications might just as well be from intellectual extractivism, from surveys, clinical interventions, mapping, ethnographies of disenfranchised communities. Implicit in such political economy of knowledge production are the assumptions that individuals merit compensation for their individual effort in their education and career path. As if there could be such a thing as individual effort and knowledge, all knowledge is collective and all individuals are, aren't but unique carriers of knowledge from collectivities and communities be it parents, peers, collaborators, colleagues, or co-organizers. Scholars who claim to be, we hear a lot about uh, these days about public-facing scholarship. I don't know here in Canada, but in the US a lot. 
Um, and I always like to mark the difference between, um, you know, public facing scholarship and community engaged uh, scholarship. Public facing, if you intervene in Twitter uh, commentaries, if you write reports to, you know, the World Bank or anything beyond the, you know, the, the, you know, the walls of, of academia, could might as well be called public facing scholarship, and that's what I've been hearing. And I make that I, I think that's that very different from committed community engaged scholarship. So should should scholars who claim to be doing community engaged work should should carefully and intentionally reflect on what is it that is reciprocal, equitable engagement between thinkers, organizers working across the power and resource differential of distinct regimes and spaces of knowledge production. Merely naming oneself public facing scholar may lead to the risk of underrating the personal, professional, and financial challenges uh, that doing intentional resource sharing with community requires. While public facing as potential publicity for the university is increasingly encouraged and even well compensated um, in the competitive and celebrity showbiz of the academic industry, true commitment of time and resource distribution to communities of collaborators beyond the confines of the university wall and brand are prone to be boycotted, marginalized, or punished in the mainstream metrics of tenure and promotion. How then can collective conditions be built into scholarship? The tripod of reading, writing, and teaching needs to be exploded so as to reconstruct scholarship as a wide array of modalities through which a renewed and diverse breed of scholars could operate. This does not equate to disregarding traditional or disciplinary ways of undertaking scholarship, but it calls for a process of radical restructuring and exercising redistributive economic in knowledge production in order for collective conditions to be built into scholarship. In other words, emancipatory learning and organizing emancipatory scholarship requires abolitionist economics of knowledge production, knowledge sharing, and of compensation and rewarding knowledge of all nature time and geographies. For that, it's necessary that we put an emphasis on process rather than merely on final deliverables. In other words, engage in a kind of scholarship in which should a standard deliverable not come into fruition, like a book not published or a paper rejected, is still there is a socially relevant intervention embedded in the process that remain. A play stage, a poster campaign, a documentary, relationship of love and trust and respect that wasn't there before. And the lived experience remains not only for the benefit of the researcher, but in the collective memory of a constituent. A community engaged scholarship would demand a very different set of strategies if aiming for different outcomes, and that includes solidarity, solidarity, redistributive economics, also, I also call that the economics of abolition. The operational question is whether those situating themselves as engaged scholars have developed or rediscovered tactics, methods, and team assemblages to understand and act differently. Can community engaged scholarship in this time of increasing new liberalization of universities resist and create more collaborative projects within the current system? So now, so now I turn to uh, three different initiatives um, that I have engaged as, uh, you know, try to bridge um, the discrepancy and the distance uh, and the disregard between um, academic institutions and, and, and popular education projects. The first one, the first one here um, 
It's, it was um, it was a college prep, uh, college exam prep uh, at the University of Sao Paulo. Um, if you don't know too much about the like about how Brazilian educational system work, um, it has historically been the fact that uh, public uh, public higher education um, people don't pay tuition to go there. Um, imagine, can you imagine a tuition free? public university. Okay, so that means that absolutely it is not um, accessible to everybody, right? So what happens is that the middle class pay for private schooling for their children, their entire lives through high school so that they can be prepared to take the college exam prep. So the college exam prep is the funeral, is the, is the channel through which the Brazilian controlling elite emerges. So what we undertook as a uh, undergrad, um, in fact, I was in my first year, that project had been there for maybe two or three years when I started, and fellows occupied the building of psychology, which was underused in the evening, um, and they just occupied the building and said, we are going to practice what we learn in class here in service of the communities um, that we come from or with whom we care, you know, about whom we care. And so we are from different disciplines, right? Sociology, history, economics. And so we are teaching math, chemistry, physics, um, English, you name it. All that were the discipline uh, requirements for the exam. And the project was absolutely uh, self-sustained and self-managed. Um, and we had about 500 students every year um, and they would come to study with us. We were teaching them as undergrads. These were public school students and also working adults. Um, and they would come to study with us from 7 p.m. through 11 p.m., five days a week. Um, and, the pro and they would pay a minimum um, monthly fee. Say right now it would be something like $20 a month. Um, but um, the way that it was organized, that you had a, an entire collective structure of governance. The students participated in making the budgetary decisions, in organizing the uh, pedagogical material. Um, and we had actually a very high rate of, of, of uh, acceptance in public university, which was 20% at the time. But what was most important here um, is that this is not an isolated um, experience. Um, in the, from the 80s and particularly in the 90s, free exam um, college, colleges or institutions um, emerged all over the country, particularly pushed by the black movement. Um, and the reason for that is that when I went to the University of Sao Paulo and I started my undergrad in 2003, the black population in the state of Sao Paulo was 47% uh, of the population. But in the University of Sao Paulo, which is the most prestigious, sought after, highly absolutely competitive university, tuition um, free university, um, we were only 1.3 black student body in a state that has 47% of black people. And so at that time, um, this movement was spreading all over the country and also uh, pushed by the black movement with re demand for affirmative actions. So we knew that it would take very long until that could happen, but we were marching, we were occupying buildings and we were organizing um, college preps in the slums, in the favelas everywhere and they're all solidarity economy uh, organized. At the time, I didn't have a language for that. It wasn't until I met Gibson Graham's framework of diverse language for economics that I was like, wait a minute, that's what we do? You know, because I thought I was just a militant student. I didn't think of myself as an economic agent. I didn't think of myself as queer in capitalism. I didn't think of myself as building community economies, but we knew something. And we knew that not all of our students would be accepted in public university. So we made the space to be, um, um, you know, a space of life struggle. Just like I was saying, if no final deliverable, in this case, getting into colleges happens, there's this life experience that's 
stayed and transformed and taken away by the constituency who are a part of a project that they feel um, are political members of. So there is so much love in this project. This is how I have become a political subject in the first place. All of like, I have students from 20 years ago. We are all both the same age. I had some older students, um, but many of our students, some came from, um, what is it? Um, um, from youth detention centers. Some of them were homeless. And with time and the way that uh, students organized, some of them would be like hair cutter, hair cutter, hairdresser. If another student didn't, uh, couldn't pay, they would do a lottery of hairdressing services and then donate to the project. When we are in a crisis, because the university said we couldn't charge for educational services, which was a trick because foundations were charged. And so there was a law that no longer nobody could charge, but we weren't the foundations, but they came after us. And the student got together and organized all kinds of barter um, schemes, including like producing CDs and selling and giving it to the project. And at the end of the year, we were able to pay back um, uh, all the teachers and all the, the staff, three months of late monthly payments, um, after just gathering the student in what we call the arena project and explaining what the project was about, how uh, we could we could or should organize it economically in a different way, and we had you know even extra cash to rent uh, a far uh, uh, a weekend in a farm and do the student forum there. I mean this that's where the picture came from. Um, and now, you know, I have colleagues of mine who have PhDs in sociology just like me, um, um, who are my colleagues and, you know, used to be youth from uh, detention centers that had scholarship and study with us. Um, the project is still existing. And today, I am very, very proud to say that I'm a member of a generation who has drastically changed. The University of Sao Paulo was forced to adopt affirmative actions in 2012. And now we are 51% of people from public schools at UCB. And we are about 32% of black people in that student body. Thank you all the answers. Um, Now I'll turn. Now I'll turn to um, another um, practice of popular education. Now, as a grad student doing my uh, dissertation work in Brazil, particularly in Favela City of God, um, that was two thousand. Well, it's not. Has anyone here seen the film City of God? A few of you. Okay, so City of God um, is a film that many community members, it was nominated for the Oscar in 2002, uh, and many community members of Favela City of God have very harsh critiques against the movie, especially mothers, because of the way it portrayed the community as mainly, uh, you know, solely a community of um, merciless youth gangs. When I went to do my dissertation work in Favela City of God, um, I was actually interested in trying to understand this phenomenon, which was the Solidarity Economy Bank in Favela City of God. And they were printing their own currency. So this lady here, she's a princess of Candomblé. <laughs> and and her, uh, the community members decided that she was an important figure and printed her face to represent their wealth um, and their currency. Um, and I was like, community bank in a favela? How come is that? And so, you know, at the time I had such a burnout from like organizing black students and all of that. And I was like, I want to leave the race thing, you know, aside. I want to study like, you know, development, something to take a break. <laughs> and then I go to Favela City of God and I go to the community bank and it's all black women. And I'm like, okay, here we go again. <laughs> You know, and I was like, how did this even come about? And so um, I can say more about how this works, but um, the thing I wanted to share about community engaged in this particular work 
this is the current mayor of Rio. He was also the mayor of Rio in 2012. Um, and then, you know, I met Lucinha. The first time I went there, I met Lucinha. Where is she? Uh, here. This one. Uh, Chia Lucinha. Um, and she was the president of the Solidarity Economy Bank at the time. Um, and, you know, and I met her and I was like, you know, I'm coming, you know, to do some research and like, it was my first time in Favela City of God. And so she was like, okay, I'll give you, you know, a couple of minutes, <laughs> talk to me. And then she gathered a whole bunch of women and they were like, what are you doing here? What do you want from us? Why are you here? What do you have to offer? Can, can we trust you? And then it was for, I had a, you know, an interview with them. They interviewed me for like five hours until they could get a picture of what the heck I was doing there. And they said, well, at the end, she said, you know, actually, I really like your story. And I really like what you're trying to do here. But you know what? Do you, you're a researcher, right? I'm like, yes. So you must know how to write. I'm like, apparently. And she's like, you know, a whole bunch of people like you have come through here. I have given interviews. I have, you know, um, um, given interviews. People take pictures, they leave, they disappear. Everything is spread, they never come back. You know, journalists. So she's like, I've been an organizer in this community for 40 years. I, the only, I've never made money out of it, but I would like to leave a legacy. And I would like it for my grandchildren to be able to know what I have done for this community. Would you want to write a book about my life? That's the book that's forthcoming next month. Um, and uh, we co-authored this book. And I said, no, at the time I said, no, actually, I don't know how to write a book. <laughs> I was a writer. And she's like, can we try? And so we started doing interviews about her life. And I learned that um, Tia Lucinha uh, used that Tia Lucinha used together with a whole bunch of women and that she um, had uh, been lived, she had been a member of one of the first families forcefully displayed from favelas in the gentrifying touristic place in Rio to what had become um, Favela City of God. At the time, it was a, a, an urban project, unfinished, no sewage, no schools, no roads, no public transportation. Her mother and her parents were displaced there. First, they were taken to Stadium Maracanã, where they stayed for six months, and then to that favela. And if you have seen the film City of God, it ends with a new generation of children holding guns and things, right? So her brother became the next drug dealer in command of that generation for 10 years. She lost that brother, another brother, two nephews, and a, and a brother-in-law. And then uh, in the book, she says, I also lost, uh, it was six assassinations because my mom also died of a heart attack because these people are, uh, you know, our, our people were killed just by our house, almost in the same way so that we could hear from inside the house. And she said, I have watched my brother grow. My mom had to go back and you know, pay out of pocket her transportation to go back all the way across the city where she had to take care of white children, um, of, white, of you know, white children and left her children in the house. And so as they were growing up, my brother, like other youth, were exposed to a new community where there was no relationship or trust because they just you know, dumped a whole bunch of people from everywhere in there. And we had to tend to ourselves. And so she created the first community child care center in Favela City of God, which remains to this day. It's never had a grant. It's never had governmental support. In fact, they occupied an abandoned building that was supposed to be the, um, that was supposed to be a, a preschool, a community child care, and they have been running that public community child care on their own, with their own resources, now for 30-something years. Um, and so the story that I'm, I'm telling here um, of about 
five minutes here to go. But the story that I wanted to share here is, um, you know, she said, I don't want this to happen to, to anybody, but I never also thought of myself as necessarily an economic agent. So, you know, even, at, even when she was the president of the Bank of Solidarity Economy, people came to do capacity building and she was like, you know, what is that? And then when she realized that Solidarity Economy is what that community had been doing forever, right? So then again, the power of naming the language. This book, which is a co-authorship with Chalusian, and this is just a snippet of her story. It's an amazing story. It's called a City of Goddesses, a political biography of a community organizer. We made a purpose to make that book um, be co-authored. It has a lot of her oral voice, but she also edited and co-edited with me many times over Zoom. It's been going on for almost six years now because she had to choose all of the, all of the researchers, all of the people who she wanted to speak about her life. Um, and um, yeah, it's gonna it's, it's gonna be launched. But to her, it was really important to just like to name myself, name herself. I'm a community researcher. I'm like absolutely, and now a writer, absolutely. Um, and when we talk about economics of abolition, how is it? Where are the resources? So for this particular book, I had to make a choice. If I wanted it to be sort of my tenure track book. I wouldn't have co-authored with her. I wouldn't have published in Portuguese. We wouldn't have gone with an independent press. Now I used my research fund to pay for the production of this. Uh, we had our own peer review and it's gonna be published by an independent press and all the revenue is gonna go for her and for the organization, which might not change her life forever, certainly won't, but it means a lot. So what stays as deliverable? What means is the process is what I mean. Um, I don't have much time, but I, I wanted to just uh, say quickly, um, that's community city of goddesses. Um, each one of these women have stories that could be a book each. I think the last, the last one I wanna talk about now is a professor. Um, is the black, is the black uh, community geography, uh, black geography uh, gathering, which happened in Rio last year. Organizing gatherings where conferences consider the state of communities at site of knowledge production from the US institutional mentality, that's very hard to do. Even now I'm organizing the same conference in, in August, and the funding should not be spent in New York City when they're going to meet with other grassroots organizations because it's got to be what happens within Rutgers. Like, I can't tell you how, how many hours of my first year when I should be writing, I was filling out forms, W8, W9, all the text forms, translating, educating Western Union staff members, educating all across the working chain of the university. I need work. I was doing full-time admin work when I could and should have been publishing to make this happen. But these were people with whom I had relationships throughout seven years. And it was time for us to come together and meet not only on their site, but also on my site now, and they're coming in, in October. But we went to places like Tejero de Candomblé, Mandiata. This is, you know, uh, Tejero de Candomblé, Mãe Beata. We know that and, and, and the conference or the, the gathering is around four axes, black ecology, black economy, um, and abolition. So we went to all of these different uh, community spaces. This is a very, very important uh, Tejero of Candomblé, Afro Brazilian religion. Um, we convene in circle. We listen to the priestess of the house, she tells us about how she doesn't have a, uh, how he, he doesn't have a medicine degree, but attend to all the health care in that community, communities who are at, um, at risk and at actual exposure to militias. Evangelical 
supported militias attacking Afro Brazilian religion, uh, religions. So going to these spaces and, and naming them as a space of knowledge against the entire grain of like all the barriers for that not to happen. The day this, this conference gathered about 80 people every day with food, transportation, 30% of them lodging, even international flights. The day the conference started, the money had not come from Rutgers. The money was still there. How did this happen? Four days, we went to the MST, the Landless Peasant Movement. We went to, uh, um, to the MST, the Landless Peasant Movement. We went to Terreiro de Candomblé. We went to Pavela da Maré. How did that happen? Uh, I had some savings. The first time I had ever savings in my grand, in my from after grad school, and I had to put what I had to make that happen. Of course, it wasn't enough. So my people held this down. My people held this down, and this only happens because relationship of trust and knowledge and acknowledgement has been built over time. Now, if I am frightened by the publish or perish fear mentality. I want to be doing that. Because I already feel the whip coming through. Like you're supposed to be publishing at least one paper every semester, right? In another language, yes? So that's why I say community engaged scholarship takes boldness. It takes patience and it takes risk. So we can't allow people who are not doing that say they're public facing whatever, and get celebrity money out of the industry. That's not fair. We should be very serious anytime we say community engaged work because people's lives are at stake inside and outside academia. I will just end with, these are maroon women fighting the Navy who have occupied the collectively Collectively, collectively titled land, maroon land in Bahia. There are nine of them are coming to the United States um, to, um, to the Black Geography Gathering. Come on, right. Eu venho de Três Lagoas fazer barulho na terra alheia. Eu venho de Três Lagoas fazer barulho na terra alheia. I shed the campesinos of the MST who hold us down with their tremendous amount of work against the militias, against, against, against the mayor, against, against everything. So this is the space of learning. There are eight of us there. All of the money that came was to buy them infrastructure. When we leave the places where we do research, we need to leave stuff. All this conversation about, oh, we need to give back to the community. If we don't extract, if we don't take away, we ain't got nothing to give back. It's there. You know what I'm saying? It's there. So that's a calling. I feel this room, there's a lot of people who do this kind of work. And I think that we need to have more and more ties for international solidarity in this regard. And you know, what do these communities, what do all of these projects have in common? And what they have in common are popular education at work, cooperativism at work, abolition economics, because this place is for all of us. And so are other places. But to go to Favela City of God, you need to cross, across war pain. I mean war pain, 10 a.m. Black populations in majority black territory as a state enemy. I mean the army in those favelas. City of God does not have one high school, public high school. 70,000 people live there, half of which, half of which are youth. So anytime that we hear that black people brilliant is being trumped by anti-black violence, we need to remember that. That against the fact that someone 
had her brother become internationally known as a youth who did not have the same opportunity, she mobilized all that she had to create a child care center that still exists. And this is in honor and love and respect for children of City of Goddesses. Thank you. One more. I guess I'll go with these two first. Thank you for this great, great question. Um, Alisa Frost, I want to say uh, send love and shout out to Nicole Boros, who was doing all the pro. Go, go for her. Thank you. Um, abolition, woo. Um, I mean, over like the past, I'll say five years, and especially at least in the US since George Floyd, a brutal assassination. Um, there's been a lot of uh, organizing with a calling to defund the police and abolish the prison, the military prison industrial complex. So abolish prison and defund the police. There is in you know black study and black organizing a long um, tradition of demonstrating and explaining the um, simultaneous, I don't know if that's a word, but the, the origins of policing in slave patrolling. So not just um, the institution of the police and the institution um, of slavery merging together, but they also say that it's not just about ending it's not just about the bricks and mortar, it's just ending the building, right? It's about understanding that it is a call to end police, the police by defunding and re-diverting the funds to community-based forms of economics like this one. The, 
If I could, I, I don't have the numbers, but the only presence of the state, not the only presence, but the overwhelming presence of the state in favela city of God are police cars, guns, and war cars. War cars. How much does that cost? And they are working in an occupied building of a child care center. Public abandoned, no high school. So when we say defund the police, the abolitionist movement is saying abolish prison, dismantle the system. And it's not just prison, but the police as a corporation, but policing, policing. In this case, I'm trying to apply this to a, a, a word kind of re reference of the industrial, intellectual industrial complex to say that we are also police. If we know theory of the oppressed, you know there is a theatrical form of theory of the oppressed that's called the cop in the head. All the disciplining, all of the ways that our body gets, you know, stuck and controlled our imagination. So abolish it, abolition is about um, understanding the structural forces that make our society value policing and death-driven system over life-sustaining systems. And in order to undo that, like Maria Makaba says, we need to look at the million experiments that people are doing like this one. Otherwise, we can never believe that it's possible. But if it's submerged and invisible, we don't see and we don't name, it seems like police and prison is the only thing, but they show that it's not. You can do childcare instead. Is that a oh. Oh, because, uh, well, there's a lot of, yes, uh, um, yes, abolish, um, Capitalism. So I'll just use I'll just use I'll just quickly use an image. So like Gibson Graham offers us a very interesting image. And the image is that they say we live under capitalocentrism, meaning we only name, we only see, we only have a lens to name and see that which is considered economic and the economy under capitalist lenses and metrics. So in, in it's like an iceberg. The tip of the iceberg is the capitalist matches. Formal labor, like look, right? Uh, boss and, and you know, all of that, <laughs> passport. Um, and then underneath you have slavery. Underneath you have barter system. Underneath you have community economies. You have solidarity economies, right? You have co-op. But if we don't change the lenses to see these economics, which I'm calling economics of abolition, because we need to abolish both the policing of our understanding and landscape of what economics is in the first place. So mutual aid project is, you know, it's part and parcel of envisioning abolitionist futures. Um, that was a long, it, it, it's a quick question. <laughs> it's a small question with a lot of answers. Um, yes, so how do I see that in City of God? I mean, look, I'm just the example of Lucia, just to be quick. Um, she was the pre she created this uh, community child care center. She was the president also of the community uh, bank. She was a leader organizing the housing. So like, so that you understand the network, she used to do this in her home. It was called child care in her home. But in 1990, 1996, city of God flooded again because there's no sewage drainage, it's by the river, right? So when it floods, all the sewage goes back into home. You can just imagine, right? To this day. So her home had like two meters of water and she had to move out. So in that time, that happened to many families. Hundreds of people died. Some families occupied this building. But when they were occupying this building, they're also, you know, you know, connecting all other social movements inside the favela and outside the favela to request housing project, she was part of that movement. So when they moved out of this building, they already had a look at her and they were like, I really, you need to come, 
right? They're safeguarding that public space for them. As soon as they had used it for housing, they were like, can you see her, the child care killer's here, come, 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 before anybody takes it. She only got recognized as an institution recently because she had to petition for almost 20 years to be formally acknowledged because it was an occupation, so there is no address. And without address, you can have no legal claim over nothing. So she had put so much pressure for uh, engineers and architects in the city to redesign so she could have an address, so she could get recognized as an institution. And then perhaps now, um, even have you know partnerships with the city or or other organizations. Thanks. I uh, really appreciate your presentation. Uh, I'm wondering how folks in the city of God deal with their safety and security when you have these militias that the cops themselves are coming after the people. How do they deal with Yesterday, uh, Lucina, my co-author, she was walking around trying to get um, some um, missing image use permission. And as she was telling me, I just came from this person's home. I was here. This was 3 p.m. Now, that was police operation. The community thread, uh, thread uh, dreads police occupation more than they do their actual power system because that power system is legible in some kind of way. It's legible because you know, like Chilutina, she walks by, some of the kids she has taken care of are now part of, um, you know, parallel organized forces. And when she walks by, they're like, and she's like, I know. If they do something, something happens to her, anything that happens, you have family members that you can go to. That's, there's two different systems. One is dealing with the state and the other one is dealing with the powers within. And the state is way more dangerous is what every favela resident will tell you. Yeah? <laughs> they come with no warrant, warrants. They break through people's homes. They shoot, you know, broad daylight. And interestingly enough, the uh, Citibank, the city of uh, the Bank of Favela City of God was the second of four the, uh, Solidarity Economy Bank. And interestingly enough, the film helped justify that intervention because it was part of a like social, it was part of the entrepreneurial response to pacifying police unit. The pacifying police unit was police occupation of favelas in Rio. It was the most devastating public security experience you could ever imagine. So that's one way. Another way is that they have WhatsApp group. WhatsApp is everything. WhatsApp, WhatsApp y'all, is everything. Because by the time the police comes over there, it's like there's 3,000 people knowing. The pigs are coming, the pigs are coming. Plus community uh, journalism, yes.
Um, yeah. Bolsonaro is a new Pentecostal evangelical, y'all. And I, and I want to say that only, you know, to follow up by saying some of these women are also evangelical. Both of them are. In fact, her sister is. Oops. You know? So the merging of the entrepreneurial mentality is spiritual entrepreneurship or, or religious entrepreneurship. Like you go and you pray and, you know, your business is going to thrive. Your man is going to come back. You know what I mean? All of that's happening. But the fascist absurd of conservatism find fertile ground to grow there. And then you add that, you map upon that racism and religious racism, because these people, most of them have lived and survived as practitioners of Ubanda Candomblé. Because if you don't know, that's sort of the, the temple of, of practice of Afro-Brazilian religion. And that's the hub where migrants from all over the country going to cities like developing cities like Sao Paulo and Rio, the anti, I call her anti respectfully, Tia, Tia Preta, the black anti, were the ones holding down this community. And they would come and be sheltered, fed, you know, medicated, supported, counseled within Guerrero de Candomblé. That's the utmost community economy there is in that country. Can't get more solidarity economy than that. Is going to be destroyed. It's been under attack. And then you have the militia. The militia are corrupt police officers who are no longer in the corporation. It's not like some, you know, no, it's they they all come from a practice of state violence. So they're very well rehearsed, but no longer in the corporation. So the population dread them as much as they dread the police, because they come from the same breed. And they dread them less than the drug lords because they, they know it, there is logic and there is relationship in that territory. You, you don't get to be abused in your territory by you know drug dealers. That doesn't happen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for this amazing question. Thank you, Marcelo. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you. This has been another episode of Thinking Social and Solidarity Economy. Please consider exploring our other episodes in this series or take a look at episodes in our other series entitled Work, Learning, and Social Change. While you're at it, and if you're watching this on YouTube, keep up to date on the latest material by hitting that subscribe button.